You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. Before we get into today's episode, I want to explain why it's been a month since the last episode. See, it's summer growing season right now, and even though I'm not a professional grower, nor do I grow in volume, here locally on Vashon Island where I live, I help out in a lot of different cannabis patient gardens. Because I do so much patient education here, I tend to make friends with folks who use cannabis medicine, and they often ask for a little help with you know this or that during the summer. Well, there was a whole lot more of that this year than ever before. Uh, More and more people are wanting to grow a few plants to make their own tincture or RSO or whatever. You know, it's great to see, but that's a lot more people to, you know, help get set up and help identify deficiencies and then stop by to help them determine if a plant is male and, and when to harvest by looking at the trichomes. Because I got into this work with patients, um, I chose to work in their gardens rather than be in my office in front of the computer pretty easily. Also, though, this is research and development season for me. Um, Summertime is when probiotic growers and cannabis breeders are practicing their craft, and I got to go out into the field to learn. Earlier this month, I disappeared into Humboldt and Mendocino for a couple weeks to record content for the YouTube channel and also find out what's, you know, new and interesting. And, you know, that is time that I'm not in the studio making shows. That said, these road trips without an agenda where I just explore and meet people keeps the podcast and the YouTube channel content interesting. It's from going on those kind of feral trips that the energy and the ideas for Shaping Fire come from. So yeah, next thing I knew it was August and it's been five weeks and here we are. In my own defense, I also did have two guests postpone recording their episodes last minute because they too were also busy getting their own full-term crops in the ground. We'll talk to them in November. If you want to learn about cannabis health, business, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you new podcast episodes as they come out, delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items for the week and videos, too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, we're giving away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. There's nothing else you need to do to win except receive the newsletter. This month, we are giving away several packages of Happy Endings Compost Tea Mix and the Ocean Bounty Flowering Soil Amendment from Green Bicycles. I use this stuff in my own garden and love it. In fact, I talked with Green Bicycles founder Patrick Smith about his tea on the YouTube channel recently. Go to shapingfire.com to sign up for the newsletter and be entered into this month's and all future newsletter prize drawings. My guest today is Colm Riley, co-founder of Malibu Compost, an ultra-premium living food web compost. When I first heard Colm speak about the bioregionalism of microbes, I just about jumped out of my seat with curiosity. The idea that all of this living soil microbe community stuff we're all into actually differs by location and climate really opened up a huge new set of variables and understanding, and I really had to ask him a bunch of questions about it. That's what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to go deep, deep into compost. Welcome to the show, Colm. Fantastic to be here, Shango. Excellent. So nice to hear your voice again. So so let's get started with some quick basics because there's some people who are still pretty new to compost. And so for people who don't know, please give us a brief understanding of what compost is and how basically it's made at home. Excellent question. And there is a lot of confusion around compost. So not to sound like the stereotypical professor, but sometimes it helps to start with a definition. And In this case, I'd like to give a definition that actually just got reworded in the last year by the U.S. Composting Council, but it's important to kind of break down. And what they say is compost is the product manufactured through the controlled aerobic biological decomposition of biodegradable materials. So it's undergone mesophilic and thermophilic temperatures. You're reducing the weed seeds and the pathogens. You're stabilizing the carbon to make it beneficial to plant growth. Uh, And then there's a whole host of uses for it. But it's important to understand in that definition that it's a controlled process and it's aerobic and biological decomposition of materials. 
So, so before we go to the biologic decomposition with uh, aerobic, which means oxygen, um, what are the two thermics that you, uh, I don't know those two words. Uh, mesophilic and thermophilic refer to different temperature ranges. So um, we'll take this down to the home composter. So when you pile a bunch of stuff in a corner of your yard and come back a year later, that's not really controlled and it's not really aerobic. And there's definitely some biological decomposition, um, but you're missing two of those other factors. And as far as temperature, when you turn a pile or cut into it, sometimes you can see steam. Sometimes you can put your hand in and feel the heat. Um, but the temperature is one of those four variables of the earth, water, air, and fire. That's the fire aspect. And so a thermophilic process is when you get temperatures that exceed 133 degrees. And that's sort of considered the proper threshold. It kills off weed seeds. It'll kill off pathogens like a fecal coliform or E. coli or salmonella. Um, but you don't really want that thermophilic range to go much higher than 160 degrees where you start killing off a lot of the beneficial microbiology and we can come back to that so a typical compost cycle you want to build the materials such that they can have airflow and the carbon and nitrogen materials are mixed with moisture being another variable in such a way that the temperatures can exceed 133 degrees so that hot phase is considered the thermophilic breakdown of the compost pile and mesophilic is more of sort of that simmering down range as the temperatures drop under 130, but they're still well above uh, an ambient temperature. As far as getting to that temperature, um, uh, some people, you know, bake their soil, and that's not what you're talking about, right? You're talking about letting the compost itself generate heat from degradation and bringing its own temperature up, right? Absolutely. I mean, one of the ways I like to break it down when I talk to kids is think about microbes sweating. And if you've got a whole bunch of microbes with a gigantic pile of food to consume, their job is to shred that food. Literally, some of it, we, we have soil food webs called shredders. So they are shredding and they are sweating and they are working up steam, literally and figuratively. And so that breakdown is what's producing that heat as you have this bacteria breaking down, attacking the surface area of the materials. Again, they need oxygen. A lot of people don't understand the importance of airflow, but it's like any living organism. You need water and air and food to survive. Uh, so during this process, with all that new material that hasn't yet been broken down, that's largely when you see the temperatures is in the first phase of the composting process where you have this rapid breakdown and decomposition that's all run by these digesters. Just the think of it, the compost pile is like the the digestive tract um, pre-application of the soil. Right on. That makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, you know, uh, that might be a definition you develop for kids, but uh, that is really gets right to the point. I think I'm going to be using that myself with adults. So <laughs> so thanks for sharing that. So so the other part of your definition that is really important is the um, aer aerobic breakdown, because this is very specifically oxygen centric. So you will you break out that part of the definition? Yeah, and there's there's two things, I guess, in the broad sense of things, it's important for your listeners to understand. There's what I would term intentional composting and what I would term organics recycling. And both of them have a very important place. And I would say organics recycling is trying to take organic matter and recycle it in such a way that you can derive benefits and get the nutrients back out of it and reapply it to the land. And even a lot of quote-unquote composting facilities or operations or people calling themselves composters or even material in the marketplace labeled as compost uh, is really recycled organic matter. It's been piled up. It's been degraded. It's kind of broken down and it's sort of turned into this um, broken down black or brown material that's not as distinguishable from how it started. But that's not necessarily a controlled process, you know, with the biological, the chemical, or the physical properties in place. So intentional composting is really looking at what do you want out of this? What, 
we're looking for all the attributes of compost, everything that compost is, and we're building the pile and controlling the process to derive that out of the finished product. So we need air. We need the pile to breathe, and a pile typically breathes from the bottom and breathes out, and that's what's allowing the microbes to break everything down. Turning the pile is critical because as things compact, the oxygen, the space for free air space um, disappears. And the more things become compact, compacted and the more oxygen that's eaten up by the microbes in the pile, there's no more oxygen. And so what this leads to is anaerobic conditions. And all you need to do is take some material, put it in a glass jar and put a lid on it, a biological material, and it comes back funky and putrid. That's what happens in anaerobic conditions. Uh, it can't really breathe. And anaerobic conditions can cause a lot of harmful microbes um, and other harm to your plants if that's not properly composted, broken down, allowed to have the oxygenation process. The second part is when the, uh, when the compost gets more towards a finished phase, it still needs to be able to breathe. There's a finished process that is typically called the curing process. And if you think about a wine being allowed to, to ripen, to have this expression, there's a, a maturity and a balancing uh, during this curing phase. It also allows things like ammonia to convert to plant available nitrogen. So many of people now that you kind of hear the definitions, you can understand. You can cut into a bag or sometimes open a bag of commercial compost and you get this strong ammonia smell. That means the compost wasn't finished. It wasn't the microbes weren't finished doing their jobs, or it was exposed to anaerobic conditions. And the same thing happens with severely compacted uh, compost. Even on our farms or in your piles, you'll find that oftentimes at the bottom of the pile. And you can certainly turn that around, reamend it, um, keep working it, recompost it for all intents and purposes as a way to do it. But the idea is that. Ultimately, take it through a process. Have the materials in the proper ratios to begin with, with the moisture and the oxygen. Turn the piles so you avoid the anaerobic phase. You create hot temperatures to be able to kill off the pathogens and the weed seeds and break it down. And then let it cool down and simmer and finish during that mesophilic phase to where the compost is going to mature and stabilize and be ready to do its job in the soil. You know, um, <clears throat> that idea about opening a bag of compost and smelling the ammonia, I actually was really startled the first time I, you know, because that's the stuff that I normally get, right? That's the stuff that I have historically purchased is stuff. You open it up. It's a little damp. It smells like ammonia. It's like, okay, this is what I use. But then I did score a bag of your Malibu compost and, and when I opened it, you know, it, it wasn't wet it didn't smell like ammonia and visually it looked like really really high quality soil it was it was more it was more granular with occasional chunks and it and it smelled good it had that 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 hummus smell like you get when you go out into the forest and you smell like the forest duff as you as you walk along and i'm like i'm like oh my gosh this is this must be what it's supposed to be like because i i got I, you know I, I picked up a bag after i heard you speak for the first time right so I'm like, yeah. all right, this this stuff sounds crazy. I need to check this out for myself. And so, boom. So, and then I'm like, wow, this this really is incredible. So, so since since our conversation is moving slowly but surely towards talking about um, microbioregion, and and you and your company ship all over, um, let's t take that basic idea of how we make compost at home and scale it up. Because I've seen photos of your compost piles on your Instagram and they are, you know, I've got a compost pile, right? But you've got like, like these long compost lines. That's like a huge pile that just goes on and on and on. That looks like it goes on for acres, you know, in the photographs. So, so will you give me, uh, give us a little idea of how you take that basic idea of compost and then you scale it up so that you can make a premium commercial product. And 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 once we have those those technicalities of the scale up, we'll 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 have a good basis for for our next uh, wave of the conversation. Absolutely, yeah, I mean it. 
the the principles are all still fundamentally the same. Um, and so in your home compost pile, if you're looking to get thermophilic hot temperatures, you're going to need at least one cubic yard of mass of material. That means at least three feet tall, three feet wide, three feet deep, minimum. And typically your compost will shrink 50%. So you want to build your piles much bigger and they're going to shrink down. But you need to have enough mass to have those microbes be able to generate that heat and break it down. So understand that as a general rule of thumb when I you know, tell people home composting systems. One of the simplest things you'll find is either a pallet system with four pallets, one underneath and three on the sides, or a, a large kind of circular chicken wire type of structure where you can make your compost in. But you need to have enough mass. And so we're doing the same thing on the farm in terms of mass, but we're using a windrow system. And so a windrow is just essentially a large, long row I typically build the piles no higher than five or six feet tall, knowing that they're going to shrink, and no wider than 12 feet tall. We do use a compost turner um, to turn the piles and kind of goes through it, turns the outside in and the inside out. You can also roll your piles with the front end loader or a skid steer is one of my favorites. Uh, but essentially, you're just building it in a long structure. It's the same concept that you have enough material in one place together. Uh, another consideration is obviously having that proper carbon and nitrogen ratio, and we can certainly you know, talk more about that, but that's where you hear people talk about your greens and your browns and layering it, but it's important no matter what you do is understand the exact characteristics of whatever you're using uh, in that pile. And as the piles shrink, you want to have more material you sometimes want to start a new pile. So in home compost or people with tumblers, they say the compost is never ready. Well, it's hard to have it ready when you're always adding brand new material. So sometimes a two-bin system is great where the one gets really tall and full and then you start a new pile and you're able to kind of rework your old pile. So in a commercial setting, I'll have the same thing. I'll build a windrow five or six feet tall it gets 140, 145 degrees inside. Everybody's steaming away and chowing down. And that pile suddenly shrunk from five and a half feet to three feet tall. And so for that secondary phase of the compost, oftentimes I'll push two windrows together and combine them. So there's still enough mass to hold the heat and finish the process. But the other variable, you know, when you're dealing with California and Oregon and winters and summers is you want to be able to hold in moisture. You don't want too much surface area in the winter months, and sometimes you have to employ covers, fabric covers that allow them to breathe, and you should do that for a home compost pile as well. Uh, but sometimes in the summer, I want to trap the moisture inside so I don't have to artificially add moisture coming in with a, some type of a water wagon or something else. But creating those ratios in the beginning and getting that down is critical. Um, so in terms of scaling it up, the principles are still the same. Uh, when I inoculate the piles using the biodynamic method, I might have a windrow that's 100 yards long, but I'm dividing that windrow into 8 or 10 different or 12 or 13 different sections. So each section is approximately, for biodynamic purposes, I look at each section of the windrow every 7 to 10 tons of windrow is like its own unit and I want to inoculate that small part of the pile. So it's it's a long system but I think of it as all these little batches combined. Much like somebody who's planting cannabis. You might have one plant that you're treating as one plant but you might have a whole row that's planted in the ground. And one of the things you want to realize is in between those plants is a vast array of, for all intents and purpose, biological intelligence. So oftentimes people think that, you know, their little drip watering systems just at the base of the plant is the most efficient way to do it. And maybe it's efficient in terms of overall water. But when you look at the grand scheme of it all and really harnessing all the life and all the power beneath the soil that's available to you, you're missing out on a vast amount of biological intelligence, of biological resources, and 
nutrient resources that lie within the soil in between those plants because they do communicate with each other whether you're paying attention to it or not. So dividing it into sections but really keeping an eye at the really big picture is one of the important things of scaling it up. And then the third variable goes back to that idea of intentional composting is selecting your materials with meticulous care. And for Malibu compost and for biodynamics as a whole, it all starts with the cow. And we can go into a hundred of different reasons with that. And that kind of goes into that microbe and the bioregions. But we're looking at a clean, grass-fed, organic dairy cow manure. And having that rich manure blended with the proper carbon materials to be able to have a good carbon nitrogen ratio to start the composting process and blend it in such a way that we can pile it up where um, it's homogenous enough to be able to have an even controlled biological breakdown and not end up, uh, if it starts with chunks of hay and chunks of manure and chunks of this, oftentimes you're going to end up with uh, a wide variation in the biological decomposition of the pile and you'll find really hot pockets and really cold pockets when it comes down to temperature so you're not having a homogeneous even uh, microbial controlled breakdown which is what we're ultimately trying to do even if we are uh, scaling it up right on that makes a lot of sense so so uh, feeding the cows grass and and leaving the cows organic and not pumping them full of chemicals that's fairly obvious um but uh but what is your reasoning for specifically using dairy cows and um i should preface this by saying is one of the most important aspects of making compost is use what's available to you for all your local composters find what's most readily available and then work your way out and around your local region in that regard. Um, for us at Malibu Compost, because we're doing a bagged product, we really started with working backwards from what is the most valuable, most superior, what could we think of as the best compost on earth, and then work backwards from that. And that's what's brought us to biodynamic agriculture. And there's a number of different reasons for that, but there's something incredibly special about the cow is the cow is a giant digestive fermentation machine. The cow, it's not meant to run and jump. The cow stands and eats and digests and has four stomachs. And there's a 12 days of that digestive process from the time that that grass enters the cow's cud and starts chewing to whether it comes out the other end. So there's all this fermentation and these enzyme and these bacteria. But the cow itself, and you see this now um, as research is coming out, grass-fed dairy cow also produce specific compounds. One of them CLAs or conjugated lineolic acids. And you'd have to ask somebody who's much more of a chemist than I to really break that into it. But there's a link. And Really what it comes down to is you need high quality soil to create plants. And if you have high quality healthy plants that are deriving their mineral nutrition from the soil and the air, this builds a high functional immunity in the plants. And plants that are strong and have strong immunity and strong immune systems – that then gets transferred to us as humans in the form of food. So it sounds pretty simple, but eating healthy food from healthy plants creates healthy people. And that all starts with the health of the soil. So that kind of backs up to what goes in the soil. And what we've seen is that the cow, it's not just the digestive process, but the cow is eating grasses. It's eating local grasses that are grown specific to this area. And we can get into Allen Savory and rangeland management and grass management. And that's probably a whole nother show for you if you haven't had one already. And I direct people to Acres USA and a lot of other resources that look at no-till and grazing and pasture management. But 
they all have something in common, which is all these perennial grasses, all these local grasses um, that are indigenous to different climates. You can find a hundred different grass types in a field, and you might find some weeds that are in there, often considered weeds, but they might be performing a specific function to create balance in that soil. And so a cow on, out on grass is is processing biological material that's specific to that locale. It's those local indigenous grasses and pasture grasses that are passing through the cow, coming out the other end and fertilizing that pasture. And nature knows what it needs. And nature has this incredible symbiotic way of balancing itself out if and when given the chance. And so while it might sound like a stretch of the imagination, I would say I would go so far as to say that the cow's digestive system has almost a perception, if you will, of what that grass and that pasture needs for fertility. And between the grasses that it's grazing on and the manure that's coming out the other end, and up to 25% of that manure could be considered microbes it's passing on the same fertility that's needed to keep in balance and continually improve those pastures. So that's what we're after in that dairy cow manure is all of those microbes, is all of that balance, is all that processing of those living native annuals and perennials uh, and those grasses that are just growing in harmony with the soil underneath. And because of the nature of the dairy cow industry, not all dairies are, because of land, are able to grow all the forage that they need. And so they end up often having much more pasture land than they can for food. And so if they're not growing all their own food on site, oftentimes they have land close by. You know, both of our farms that we work with in California and Oregon have off-site hay pastures. So they grow their own hay still vertically integrated. They just do it a couple hours away because of the value of real estate, obviously. Um, but what we find there is still by controlling those variables, they're not getting hay that's imported from hundreds of miles away or from different states that who knows what it has in it, but you're really controlling this microbial population in different regions that are going to have their own positive effect, not only on the soil, but it goes then also into the plant. And plants that have a stronger native soil, have stronger indigenous microorganisms, they're able to build a stronger immune system. And it's, you know, much like humans that are able to do well in an area where you grew up, or we see this with different cultures, different cultural phenomenon, it's the same kind of function of building that immunity and building that plant health um, through building the soil health. So um, in, our, in our second set, we're going to talk a lot more about uh, local microbes. But, but, but as we wrap up this first set, um, I was curious, you know, uh, I, I admit to not knowing a lot about cows actually at all. Um, but but um, you always, when you talk about it, you talk about dairy cows, um, <clears throat> thus excluding meat cows. And I always wondered, was there something about the biology of a dairy cow and that the cow is, you know, at a part of her life that she's giving off milk? Does that add some kind of fertility to her output in and of itself just because she's at that stage in her life? Exactly. Once a cow has given birth and is producing milk through that lactation cycle, there's a whole different set of enzymes that become present in the cow's rumen and in the cow's digest in the cow's cud. Really, it starts in the cow's mouth as they're chewing those grasses. And so that's passed on. And we see you know, the, the, the fatty acids and the milk content. And we're able to analyze all these different compounds in milk now. And we can see through the growth of probiotics and utilizing raw grass-fed dairy cow milk for making cultures and making labs and all sorts of, I mean, you can just do an experiment with store-bought milk and with organic milk and with raw milk. And, you know, you can see the difference in its ability to, to go through, you know, that 
process, and that's really a reflection of what's in there. So that mother dairy cow has these different enzymes that are produced, and we're looking for the same kind of probiotic elements, if you will, coming out one end of the cow that's coming out in the form of the milk of the cow. Now, that's not to say that there's a lot of benefits to the male cows, but and you see that because an organic male cow would be considered out on grass would be grass-fed beef and grass-fed beef still contains a lot of those same conjugated lineolic acids that you find in dairy products and these are compounds the body just doesn't produce them they we need them but the body just doesn't produce them and so this is one of the ways that you're able to get it and that same kind of fertility it's not necessarily in the composting process but i would encourage your listeners to take a look at the Marin Carbon Project and the work of John Wick down in Marin with restoring the rangelands. But we've seen that the fertility of these animals grazing after years and years of not grazing on rangeland that has been deg you know, has degradation year after year. One summer of these cows grazing reverses the degradation of the land, and it starts a carbon sequestration cycle through one application of compost. Furthermore, native perennials start coming back, and the cows pick up weight. And over the summer months, they become much more lush. They gain weight. You can physically see the difference in the in the coats of the cows. Um, but really, the most fascinating thing is what's happening under the soil as this process of grazing and these nutrients getting restored to the soil are able to literally reverse this problem of soil degradation and sequester carbon. And that is one of the greatest opportunities that we have available as we look you know, towards our future and we look at these issues of global warming and the amount of carbon and the challenge of growing healthy food and the challenge of soil degradation and land that has been abused and soil that has just died off after years and years and years of chemical, synthetic, conventional agriculture. Right on. <clears throat> Thank you, Colm. So we're going to take our first short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Colm Riley, co-founder of Malibu Compost. Now that the health benefits of terpenes have become well-known in the cannabis industry, people everywhere are looking for the purest terpenes without adulterants. The problem with most terpene providers is that they're not sourced naturally and instead are made as a byproduct of refining petroleum, and that's so sketchy. The terpenes sold by True Terpenes are entirely different. They are certified organic, non-GMO, and food grade. That means that they are extracted from real plant sources. There are no solvents of any kind. They are distilled only with steam. That's right, only steam. In fact, terpenes from true terpenes are so pure that you can eat them. Not only that, but you can stack them with better results too. And what I mean is, other companies' terpenes have got a few percent of impurities, and when you stack those terpenes to make your blend, you're adding a variety of impurities that degrade your final product. True terpenes also have strain-specific terpenes for a wide range of cannabis strains like Durban Poison, Sunset Sherbet, and Granddaddy Purple. True terpenes has robust and supportive customer service, so your questions will get answered fast and efficiently. If you've shopped for terps before, you know how rare that is. So whether you want to cup your hands to smell some beta caryophylline to calm down after getting too high, or if you want to dab some pinene so your lungs feel fabulous and your mind feels liberated, True Terpenes will provide you with a truly natural experience. If you are a cannabis product developer, these are the terps you want to add to your oil or edible or capsule or whatever. True Terpenes are simply the best your money can buy. Don't try and make a premium product with substandard terps. Choose true terpenes for a top shelf experience. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash true terpenes to find out more or click on the link in this week's newsletter. Using pesticides when growing cannabis has been common for a long time. Nowadays, though, we know better. We know that most pesticides formulated for food crops have never been tested for use with cannabis. They've been tested to be eaten in tiny doses. They have not been tested to be inhaled and especially not concentrated into a cannabis oil. 
Chemical residues from pesticides are not healthy for anyone, but they are especially dangerous for patients. For commercial cannabis growers, this has become very impactful. Cannabis enthusiasts and patients have gotten educated enough that they avoid growers who used pesticides. Not only that, but states across the country have begun making pesticide testing mandatory on all licensed cannabis crops. The time has come to find a better way to fight garden pests than covering your cannabis in chemicals. And there is a better way. Let some good bugs fight your bad bugs. Beneficial insects and predatory mites have come a long way since we were buying ladybugs online and putting them in the grow room and just hoping for the best. Natural enemies biocontrol can help you solve pest issues without using chemicals. Natural Enemies founder Shane Young learned best practices from working in the ornamental plant industry and has fine-tuned those strategies specifically for large cannabis crops. Shane works with commercial cannabis clients across the country to ensure that they keep their crops safe and pest-free without the use of chemicals. Natural Enemies has proven solutions for spider mites, aphids, thrips, russet mites, broad mites, shore flies, Whitefly, and others too. You can rely on natural enemies for expertise and excellent service. For more information, go to shapingfire.com forward slash natural enemies or simply click on their banner in this week's newsletter. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Los, and our guest this week is Colm Riley, co founder of Malibu Compost. So before the break, we learned uh, soup to nuts about um, how compost is made, why it's regenerative, and how to scale it up. But one of the important things that you continually point out, Colm, is the use use of local microbes and this you know is in contrast to the idea that that compost can be made somewhere on the other side of the country and then it gets shipped to you on pallets and then you use it locally expecting it to keep your cannabis plants alive when the food is actually from somewhere else so you know it really kind of blew my mind when you were talking in San Francisco at Indo Expo about these microbioregions and the importance of incorporating local microbes in cannabis horticulture. Will you go through that line of thought for us a little bit right now in the in the difference, uh, I guess I mean the diversity of local microbes and why we want to make sure that we capture and use those local microbes in our soil for growing cannabis? Sure. And um, I guess just to say I suddenly got hit over the head with the bat of eco guilt because our compost does ship to other places and people do use it. <laughs> but that's why uh, I'm flying out at about midnight tonight back to Pennsylvania to uh, get to work again on our first windrows that we're making in Pennsylvania. Because oh, well, it's congratulations on that. Exciting as it is to ship compost to Pennsylvania, I think it's much more important to uh, make the compost in Pennsylvania and then have it available there. Um, so um, certainly sometimes, you know, something can still work and the things work on a nutritional and a biological level. Um, but yeah, there's this question of local. And uh, I guess one way to explain it would be if you think of microbes as almost livestock of the soil. Think of all the same kind of biodiversity that we have above ground in our forests and our plains and our wooded areas. Uh, think of the same just massive biodiversity of microbes underneath the soil. So you're going to have different types and different herds of microbes in different areas of the country because it's just different soil types uh, and different characteristics. And those have an important role to play in those regions and have a historical role. So with the dairy cow, it's we're, we're kind of cherry picking because the dairy cow is foraging on pastures. So those pastures have different characteristics in different parts of the country. And I would certainly say we've seen significant differences between the compost that we make in California and the compost that we make in Oregon. And not to put myself down, uh, but I feel that there is sort of an inherent, I don't necessarily want to use the word superiority, but there seems to be a much higher level of energy and diversity in the Oregon compost. And I believe 
That has a lot to do with the fact that because of rainfall and weather and some other um, meteorological phenomenon, the cows are able to be outside and have many, many more days on pasture than their California counterparts. Uh, that's certainly one of the things that you see. And uh, the pasture management is really good because of the water and the different cycles that you're able to have there. Um, but it's still important to have locally produced composts. So when you start looking at some of the microbioregions, just think that there's many, many different herds of microbes in different areas. And here on the West Coast, from the Pacific Northwest to Humboldt and Mendocino County, right down the California coastline to the redwood forests of Santa Cruz, we have an ecosystem that's largely derived from the Pacific. And I always talk about this when I'm talking about indigenous microorganisms. I always throw out the question, does a bear shit in the woods? And yes, it does. <laughs> But one thing to remember is there used to be a whole lot more bears in these woods. And what did the bears used to eat? Salmon. And then what would the bears do? Shit in the woods. So you have this fertility that's almost sort of ocean-derived spreading itself out in that nutrient footprint, whether it's from the birds or the bears or all these other animals, and filling all of our mountain ranges along the coastal lines and the rains come, and this is one of sort of the local nutritional footprints, if you will, of this type of soil. So when we're talking to growers, and it doesn't matter what you're growing, there's a significant consideration in my mind when you start thinking about how am I going to add additional fertility to your plants, and contrary to what the chemical companies will have you believe, not all NPK is created equal. It's not. So when you're putting blood meal on your plants or bone meal on your plants, you might be getting bone meal from a hog processing facility in Arkansas run by Johnsonville that you would never want to take anything from. Um and you're putting on that plants when you have available to you shrimp meal and kelp meal and crab meal and kelp meal and uh, fish meal and all sorts of crustacean derived that have a much more sort of localized footprint for what you're doing. But you find it all around. It has to do with the weeds and the plant matter that's growing in that soil. It has to do with the forest duff, as you said. Um, and so... This is a fascinating area where science is struggling and trying to catch up and almost literally invent and define this field of soil microbiology as fast as they can. And it's one of those exciting things where, you know, the science of the soil is probably just as misunderstood or has yet to be understood as from a geography standpoint, the depths of our oceans. It's just that area that we've never really hit. But everything else, you know, we've been able to define. So there's this kind of vast unknown, but we know that there's this, these different aspects of different areas. And one thing you find, which is interesting, where science is still kind of trying to explain it, is where indigenous wisdom comes into play. And, you know, Biodynamics, sometimes some of the purists like to think, okay, biodynamics was coined by Rudolf Steiner in 1924, and it's the end-all, be-all. Um, and it's not quite that way. But Steiner was much more also a um, cultural scientist, and he looked at what different cultures did. And when you start looking at some of the agricultural practices of the Mayans or the Aztecs or different Native American tribes – you see that there's relationships in their agricultural practices that have to do with the cycles of the moon, that have to do with the cycles of the year, that have to do with the cycles of plants and animals and how they plant. And there are different practices that they did. Sometimes they might not even really be able to tell you everything behind it other than it was just passed down. And 
More recently, I saw you had a phenomenal podcast talking about Korean natural farming techniques. Yeah, and that was so, uh, with Chris Trump. Yeah, and so I'm sure um, I wasn't able to catch every segment of that, but one of the things that Korean natural farming looks at is harnessing the power of these indigenous microorganisms. So something as simple as taking a plate of steamed rice in, or in a box and taking it and putting it underneath a tree on your property. And like you mentioned, that humus, that forest duff, when we say compost happens, all you need to do is go stand underneath a tree. And microscopically, every hour, every second, compost is happening. Microorganisms that you can't even see are slowly falling to the ground and getting broken up. And compost is happening on that forest floor every second of every day. And so putting steamed rice out in the forest underneath the tree is all those Millions of local microorganisms are landing on that rice and sticking to that rice. And that rice is then used as a catalyst combined with plant matter harvested from that property, filled with water, and uting, utilizing a catalyst such as a lactobacillus. And what that does, it starts that fermentation and reproduction process. And those indigenous microorganisms now are reproducing over and over and over again and replicating themselves. And you're now building populations of microorganisms that are uniquely specific to your property. And it's not that you're going after those indigenous microorganisms for NPK nutrients, but you're really going after that health that vitality and that immune system in the plant. And the stronger the plant is, as far as its ability to not have to worry and have a care in the world for pests and disease and other aspects, it can just do what it does, is have this symbiotic relationship with all the life in the soil. And having that healthy soil and having this healthy approach to the plant is what's going to create this nutrient density. You know, and you can look at a soil test and you can look at a multivitamin. Look at the label on your kids' multivitamins and look at all the compounds that you find in your soil test. And you're going to see the same compounds there. You're going to see zinc. You're going to see manganese. You're going to see iron. You're going to see all these different minerals that we look at in terms of human health. And you're going to understand that that's what's transmuting into the food. And all the secondary metabolites is really what we're looking at that can build not only just the human health and the plant health, but it's health just beyond the nutrients that our bodies crave. It's this added health and vitality. It's the, the ability to resist pests and disease. It's, we see it in children that played in the mud or grew up on a farm. They just naturally are healthier and more resistant. We don't have to look far outside away from our journals of science and our journals of nature and our journals of everything else. But the problem is we basically have a medical field in this country that knows nothing about <laughs> nutrition and health. So there's a whole disconnect here. You know, the diabetes rate in this country used to be one for every 50,000 people. Now it's one out of every 20. So something's severely wrong with our soil, with our plants and with our food. And as we take this back to cannabis, it's understanding that cannabis does have incredible medicinal properties. But to me, sometimes it almost blows your mind for people that can swear up and down that cannabis has medicinal properties, yet are completely ignorant of the fact that the medicinal properties and value of cannabis has everything to do with how it's grown. You're not going to stick a cannabis plant in a bunch of rock wool and dump a bottle, just bottle after bottle of bottle after nutrients, synthetic nutrients, and then say, oh, but the cannabis is, is it's medicinal. You know, it's, it, it's medicinal. It's, it's, uh, you know, I mean, that's, like saying a steering wheel has the ability to drive you down the freeway from Seattle to Portland. It doesn't. You need the car that's attached to it. So it's, it's, it's one aspect of it, but 
to 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 ignore that aspect of it is kind of doing the same disservice that all of us are trying to overcome um, and really be a part of the solution of what's wrong with our food system and our agricultural system and not be part of the problem. That really takes the whole idea of whole plant medical cannabis to a, to a whole nother level. Not only are you talking about all the cannabinoid constituents, but also the, the entire life and micronutrients of the plants. And, you know, you know, one of the things that always cure, I mean, not always, I've only, I've only really been thinking about this for about a year, but one of the things I've been curious about for the last year is that um, with these local microbes, uh, does it make sense to um, only use your local microbes? I would think that since everywhere in the United States, pretty much plants are growing, that you should have a complete set of the necessary microbes where you live and not necessarily have to bring them from somewhere else. I mean, perhaps you want to ship yourself a higher quality compost. That's one thing. But, but when I first started thinking about microbes, I was thinking, oh, well, if I were to order a compost, say from Oklahoma, where it's certainly more dry and the soil has a different composition than where I live in the Pacific Northwest. So I or order a bag there and I bring it here and the microbes that would come with it, you know, they're used to a drier environment. They're not used to these tepid winters. Um, they're, 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 they're built for a different environment. And I'm thinking, you know, they, they very well might not do well in my soil here, but then what if there's something that's missing? I mean, probably where I live in the Pacific Northwest, I probably have got a full set of microbes, but I can imagine that there might be parts of the country that are so, where the soil is so stripped that they really need, do need to import microbes from somewhere else because their own soil is lacking. Is there, is there any truth or possibility to that? Uh, yes, I, I think so. And this might be an area where people that are far more knowledgeable on specific microbial inoculations than I um, could speak better to that. But um, I'll throw out a couple examples. I have a very close family friend and agricultural friend that we work together who's a biodynamic vineyard consultant. And he's worked all over. He honed his craft in France and he's been all over top vineyards on the West Coast. He's utilized some microbial inoculants on some vineyards down in the central coast of California, sort of down Santa Inez type area. And one of the things that he told me was adding a microbial inoculant. What he noticed, and you know, it's not as scientifically rigorous, so please don't question my numbers, but he said something like it looked like something like after taking samples, something like 60% of the microbes that had been added died off. Wow. That they just, they weren't, they couldn't thrive in that environment. But what they also noticed was it had a detrimental effect on a lot of the indigenous microorganisms. So when something gets introduced, it can outcompete. You're 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 creating something completely out of balance. So, I, I just saw the headline yesterday that what they said like thirty thousand factory farmed salmon escaped from their free pens up in Newfoundland and now are like swimming around the ocean. And they didn't notice this. They didn't tell anybody that there was a hole in the net, and it only happened when local fishermen started catching these salmon that they were like, these aren't our normal salmon. And so they create these factory farmed salmon and they stick these pens out in the ocean, but they're highly, you know, all the fish are combined in one small area. So they're much more prone to picking up certain diseases and then they escape through the net. And now all of a sudden they're out roaming about and they can out compete. They can create, they can just create all these different imbalances. So, Going back to the soil, you can have different microbial inoculations, but there's the question of are they going to survive and thrive in a new climate, and what's the effect and impact that they're going to have on the local indigenous microorganism populations? So one of the things you're after is a lot of diversity, and there's no, there's no one silver bullet. And I wouldn't tell somebody in Pennsylvania or Maine or Oklahoma or anywhere else to just buy a bag of Malibu and that's it. Even 
in Oregon and in California, we're telling our much larger customers, people that want several truckloads of compost for their for their vineyard or for their orchard or for their cannabis grow, is if you're getting a larger amount of compost and we can work with you, bring me some of your own on-site compost. Bring me some of your topsoil. Let's bury that in the compost pile while it's cooking, while it's simmering, while it's going through this heated process. And so we can introduce those microbes right from your property into the larger thing and have them sort of work out their issues and figure out a way to get along and reproduce before they even, you know, so that way they can kind of hit the ground running for, for lack of a better way to put it. That's so um, next, that's so next level compost column. I mean, th I mean the idea that you would have this thought out to such a degree that, that you're going to actually inoculate your, I'll, I'll, you know, custom off the shelf compost with their inoculant from the locality. Um, you know, if, it's actually exciting to, to know that somebody's even bothering to do that because I think so many of the growers who are listening, you know, that's what that's that's what's in their heart. You know what I mean? And the fact that you are able to do it at a commercial level, it's invigorating. You know, it's exciting. It's super exciting. And where I really would say, you know, the proof is in the poop is <laughs> this is where compost teas become so exciting. And so this is a way that somebody can capture some of that diversity and some of all these amazing benefits that we're talking about between the cow and the digestive system and the microbial diversity and then still get it out onto their property. And um, there was a, a gentleman, Alex Podolinski, who's um, – in Australia, and you can now read about the Podolinsky method. But Alex Podolinsky followed biodynamics, and Australia was just getting devastated by this growth of commercial synthetic agriculture, and fields were getting more and more degraded. And he followed biodynamics, and he saw this and the cow and everything, but he realized we don't have cows. We got some kangaroo poop running around here, but like there's not the same massive amount of herds of cows in Australia that there are in in you know, the United States and Europe. And so what he did then was realize is we needed to make sort of a compost catalyst from the cow. And so that's the preparation that you see that there's stuffed in the cow horns that's buried underground and that's allowed to turn into this rich sort of humus uh, material. But that is literally taking a teaspoon of that and stirring it into water and diluting it to the point where it's treating one acre of land. So, you know, you can have a pound of compost that's being treating that's treating 50 acres. So, we're talking about something on the most minute and homeopathic level. Mm -hmm. And as crazy as it sounds and nobody believed this guy until Australian public television aired a special with him, and then a bunch of people thought he was into witchcraft <laughs> and thousands of farmers started driving overnight to his farm to come visit and figure out how could we do this as well. So there, the proof you can see and somebody will do a compost tea application that's only the most minute introduction in small doses. But we're looking at creating that impulse and just that small little impulse that then is going to replicate it itself and then replicate itself another time and replicate it another time. And so you're building up this health and vitality and it's not a one size fits all massive approach, but you're going over it. So no matter where you are um, – in biodynamics, I always say you always want to add your own topsoil or clay or something into your compost during that process. So while it's undergoing this transformation, you have that spectral profile, if you will, of your soil and your indigenous microorganisms added into the soil. If you're purchasing Malibu compost or any other soil for that matter – you should be looking to, maybe you don't have much of your own compost, but anything that you can have on site, maybe even you make a tea out of what you have and you're spraying that onto the compost that you can use. But regardless, one should join forces with the other and the earlier in that sort of process that that can take place, the better. If you can add something into your compost pile or into my compost pile <laughs> of yours while it's simmering and cooking, you're 
you're allowing a lot of those issues that suddenly can result from a shock type thing. Just think about, you know, transplant shock, for example. And you're mitigating that by creating something that can kind of work out their issues and then get to this point of harmony and synergy before you're introducing, you know, plants as living organisms into a chaotic environment. Rather, it's an environment that's just thriving and, you know, ready to do its job. Damn straight. Wow, that's awesome. Well, let's go ahead and take our second short break. Uh, you're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Colm Riley, co-founder of Malibu Compost. Join me at the upcoming CanMed event in Los Angeles for a gathering of the top minds in cannabis medicine. Field experts will present their latest findings and best practices in treating a variety of conditions with cannabis, including epilepsy, pain, traumatic brain injury, cancer, autism, and more. Laboratory professionals will share their revolutionary technologies in cannabinoid and terpenoid extraction, delivery methods, and quality and safety testing. CanMed 2018 is October 22nd through 24th at the Luskin Conference Center at UCLA. And while the final speakers list is still coming together, the speakers who are already announced give you plenty of reasons to get your ticket today. Prepare yourself to learn from 54 thought leader presentations focused on furthering the convergence of medical cannabis research, treatment, and product development. Speakers include the father of cannabis research, Raphael Meshulam. Michael Dorr, chief medical consultant for the Israeli Ministry of Health, will be there too. The list of esteemed speakers participating is long and includes shaping fire guests, cannabis neuroscientist Dr. Ethan Russo, and Kevin McKiernan of Medicinal Genomics. You can view all the speakers at canmedevents.com. This year's CanMed features a special education track on the application of blockchain technology in the cannabis market, including cannabis banking, seed to sale tracking, sequencing the cannabis genome, ICO financing, and more. If you are a medical care provider, be sure to arrive a day early to participate in the pre-conference CME course. Find out more about that at canmedevents.com. That's C-A-N-N-M-E-D events.com. 95% of attendees said CanMed 2017 met or exceeded their expectations. That's a serious vote of confidence that CanMed 2018 will be well worth your time and resources. So don't delay. Visit canmedevents.com today to reserve your seat and find out more. Skinny dipping? Humpback whales, beatnik poetry, the Ottoman Empire, soil remediation, interdimensional beings, and tree frogs. These are just a few of the interesting topics you can find in the audiobooks library at audible.com. If you like podcasts like Shaping Fire, chances are that you'll dig audiobooks too. Just like with podcasts, audiobooks speak to you, telling you stories and teaching you stuff. Here's the thing. Audible.com has an offer I want to tell you about. Right now, they're offering a trial of their audiobook service for absolutely free. You can go to shapingfire.com forward slash audible and you will get a free audiobook straight up. You can listen to it on your mobile device, computer, or you can download it and listen to it like anywhere. It's really simple. Of course, they want you to subscribe to their service after the free trial and enjoy their audiobooks forever, but you don't have to. All you have to do to get the free audiobook of your choice is to check out the service for free. So that's the deal. Your first book is free, it's easy to sign up, it's easy to quit, and their online library of free books is pretty incredible. Just check it out. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash audible to find out more, or click on the link in this week's newsletter. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is Colm Riley. He's co-founder of Malibu Compost. So now that we've got everybody all excited about compost, wanting to make their own, wanting to, uh, you know, wild harvest local microbes, um, let's talk a bit about the applications for compost, um, both, you know, some typical stuff that we're going to see in horticulture, but also some of the new kind of groundbreaking uh, applications that we're seeing. So, so why don't we ta start at the top uh, uh, column and, and hit each of these uh, for a little bit. So, so tell us a little bit about compost tea. Well, compost tea is incredibly exciting. And I'm sure you've had plenty of podcasts and guests who are experts in that area. I certainly wouldn't claim to be one. Um, but there's, you know, I would guess I would point out there's a distinction between a compost tea, which is considered something that's actively aerated versus a compost tea or compost extract. Um, 
And there's, you know, a lot of debate on different sides. There's, you know, a lot of people that are fiercely into the actively aerated compost teas on the Elaine Ingham side. Um, I, I've, you know, heard and read some stuff that um, Scott is working on at where he's looking a lot more towards extracts and what that does. But um, the fundamental idea is, well, I'll back it up even more. When I talk about compost tea, we put together a very, very rudimentary sort of, I call it the gateway drug to compost tea is our little Malibu compost tea bags are available on Amazon and most of your local stores. But it's a you know quarter pound of compost and a little cotton baggie. It's all dried out uh, and you soak it in five gallons of water and you put it on your plants the next day. So I did not use the word aerate there and... I didn't use it because technically if you soak it and squeeze it out and put it on your plants the next day, it's considered a cold water compost tea extract by the uh, compost tea definitions. But you could put an air stone in it and you can put your bubbler in it and you can brew a compost tea where all these microorganisms are reproducing, you know, millions and millions of times over. Um, so there's different aspects of compost teas. There's different recipes for compost teas and the things that you can use, but I also find really exciting how you can use compost teas. So whether it's an extract or actively aerated compost teas, most people look at brewing a compost tea but then watering it into the soil. And that's great because you're getting the nutrients, the minerals, the trace minerals, but really what we're looking at is all that beneficial bacteria and fungi. And we want the beneficial guys to outcompete the harmful guys. That's really what we're looking at. Um, one of the most common applications of compost teas that you'll read and hear about is adding it as a foliar spray. So if you're spraying it on the underside of the leaves where the plant stomata is, it's able to take it up through the stomata right into the plant. The way that I think that it's like a quick fix. It's sort of like a quick, has to go right into the plant's immune system. So all those beneficials are able to go right through the stomata into the plant's immune system as opposed to having to go through the soil, compete in the soil, make their way up through the root system and out to the leaves and, and uh, things like that. So you're spraying it right onto the leaves. Uh, you want to be careful that it has smaller particles because the smaller the particles, the greater the surface area, the easier the plant can absorb it. But you don't want to use some of these battery-powered super you know, atomizers because – Sometimes the force with which you spray it can kill the very microbes that you've spent all this time to breed and to, to diversify. Um, I think it's really exciting when you see tree surgeons and tree care people that will have these like 10 foot long syringes, if you will, and they're injecting compost tea down into the root system of trees as a way to balance out and add more benefits to the overall, um, it's sort of just like a quick fix of being able to treat the teas. But one of the things I always tell people is I'm typically not a huge fan. And again, I'm not an expert, so somebody can correct me, but I'm not a huge fan of brewing further than 24 hours because I just feel inherently like once you get to the point where you have to start introducing bacterial foods and fungal foods and microbial foods, once you get to that point, you're almost introducing a level of competition. And different microbes may or may not have preference for different types of food sources. So once you've blended all your ingredients and you've created all this diversity by simply adding molasses, for example, you seem to almost now be source selecting which microbes are going to do better and which microbes are going to do worse um, and are going to thrive in different competitive environments. So, you know, I'll leave that to other people in terms of overall teas and approaches. Um, but just the sheer results that people see with teas are, are it, 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 I mean, that's the proof. And, you know, when we sell an expensive compost that people can add to build your soil biology and people use it and they carefully pay attention and then they tell us how great it is. Uh, but it takes a little while. But the beauty of compost tea is people will put it on their plants and they'll call you immediately and they see the color green change and they see the leaves turn towards the sky and start praying upwards. And they they see and they feel these physical, tangible results. And that's what gets them excited. And so there's so much more you can do. 
in terms of building your recipes with teas and how you use the teas and how you're just adding this thing where something's you're using a principle of frequency as opposed to quantity and it's creating these small little impulses but just giving nature the tools that it needs to nudge it in that right direction and just keep that health and vitality in your soil and in your plants. I like that frequency versus quantity. So, you know, uh, let's also talk briefly about soil amendments because, you know, pretty much all of the the healthy probiotic stuff that you just said about compost tea will also cross apply to just simply taking some compost and mixing it in with your soil. Um, but often I, you know, hear from people, you don't want to just use compost because it may even somehow be too potent. So when you're recommending uh, compost as a soil amendment, how much do you recommend people go with? Um, if you're using a well-balanced compost, um, you know, typically you could go anywhere up to 25% of your soil, mm -hmm. um, maybe as high as 30% of your soil mix. Um, but you're going to need aeration. You're going to want some local, uh, you know, like a more of a topsoil type of blend. Um, for people who are in containers, you know, I mean, we see people who use like a third perlite, a third peat, a third Malibu and call it a day. Yeah. Um, with, with, with that. Um, but you, Compost also has a higher bulk density, it means it has less free air space. So you don't want something, and as you add more water, it's going to gradually get eaten up, taken down by the plants, and create more compaction. So you don't want to have too much compost in your mix without having the proper aeration. Um, but really, it kind of depends on what type of, you know, if you're getting something that's, and sometimes often it's things that aren't even compost because they've changed the definition now. So things that used to be called composted steer manure or composted chicken manure, they used the word composted as a substitute for aged. Yeah. Means it was just a put in a pile and it just kind of got old and now they're calling it composted. <laughs> so it's, it's different. So with things like that, you can get a lot of different pockets, a lot of different hot areas. Uh, it can burn plants. It can cr lock out nutrients. Um, you can have some different negative uh, effects by using compost, you know, using too much compost. Sure. But typically I'd say anywhere from that 10 to 25% range with what you're doing. And keep in mind that everything's all about balance. And whether you're, we're looking at the work of Dr. Elaine Ingham and she's talking about balance between bacterial and fungal, or you're looking at the work of um, Albrecht, where you're looking at these different ratios of minerals, you want to have that balance. You know, I, I it, many, many people could look at me with an absolute blank stare in the eye if I've ever asked them if they've used a bricks meter on their cannabis. Right. <laughs> no concept of it. No concept of the overall compounds. You know, it's all about the terps, dude. Um, so it, it's understanding that you want to build this diversity and you want to build this balance and these ratios. So it's just it's. I guess it's imperative to really understand what you're working with. So the quick answer would be, well, it depends on what kind of compost, but general parameter, 10 to 30% of your soil mix. Right on. Well said. And I think that you gave enough extra information that people can kind of, you know, think through the challenge on their own based on the, on the variables you gave them. One of the ways that I use, uh, uh, compost is as a as a top dress and that kind of hits on your frequency over a quantity because I'll put the compost on top and then every time I water it you know some of the goods go down into the soil and uh, and I think that's a pretty common way to use it especially uh, when people are having a uh, a not good experience with either growing their cannabis or their vegetables they're, they're going in for the save and you know and they're adding some compost on the top and watering it in uh, my question for you is when using it as a top dress, do I need to put down the compost and then put some more soil on top? Because I'm, I suspect that if we use compost and it's going, you know, and it is interacting with the air, that it's going to dry out, and all my beneficials are going to get choked out just from the dryness. No, that's a great question. Um, one is typically I tell people when they're applying it as a top dress, you just want to kind of lightly scratch it into the surface. Um, that also helps. Sometimes co composts have this sort of initial hydrophobic aspect, and you want things to just absorb evenly and, and get that flow down. 
Um, but that's also where it's important to not have bare soil on the top um, and utilizing just something as a mulch cover at the top, um, whether you're using grasses or planting cover crops is planting cover crops, whether you're in the ground or even indoors in a container, you can plant cover crops around the base of your cannabis. And that, that adds shade. Um, it, it protects the soil from being bare, which allows all these microbiology in the soil to come and literally feed off the top layer there. And so these are one of the things you see exciting in probiotic gardening, such as working with the earth box, where you're growing in a small, limited area, and your roots can't go down further. They just can't go into the ground ad infinitum and just keep going and going in search of good food. And if you're growing outdoors, you need to have a soil bank approach, a three to five year strategic approach for building your soil, because if you're not, you're an idiot, in my opinion, but you're just otherwise you're just going to outsource money that you could be building each year. But if you're in containers, you got to realize things just don't drop out of the sky and your root system can't go anywhere else. So you have an opportunity to create that top dress as a nutritional layer. And that's where you're really you're feeding the soil, not the plant. And you're adding the compost. You're protecting the top so people can come up and eat off the top surface. That's where adding amendments like a, like a Bokashi um, or just other, um, other forms of nutrients and foods that can be applied at the top surface as a top dress, but then just be gently covered up so then they can be taken not just through watering, but you know the, the microbiology in the soil will come to the surface and literally eat it and you know and excrete it and move it out. I mean we see you know indoor warehouses now where everything's grown under the lights, but they're growing in soil. And these guys have cover crops growing around the base of their cannabis plant and they'll pull back, you know, the, the hay or straw that they're using as a mulch layer and you'll see worms crawling around in, you know, a 55 gallon pot and just creating this whole sort of symbiotic food web uh, right there, even if they're limited to an indoor environment. That's that's so awesome, and especially when you know it it, it it no it replaces the dead zone at the top of a pot, you know, and you if you, if you just simply even cover it with uh, with some sort of organic straw or something, and uh, and, and it increases the size of the uh, or rather the percentage of the amount of soil that your plant can actually readily use. I would think that a a, a pot you're going to lose a certain amount of the usable soil if the soil at top is just facing the air. So you might as well put in a cover crop. Not only does it look very visually satisfying, uh, but it's super great for the plant as well. So we're almost out of time, but there there are two more things I want to hit with you, uh, Colm. Uh, one is it's it's not necessarily growing based, um, but uh, you've talked about these these compost socks that they're using at construction sites, and I, and I think that's an interesting idea. So would you just hit on that briefly, just because so people can go, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean it's. I was fascinated to learn several years ago that the largest purchaser of compost in the state of California, you know, is not almonds or not hazelnuts or not grapes or anything else or cannabis. It's Caltrans and it's the state department of transportation using it for erosion control on highway projects. And what they've realized is it's just, it's that ability to create, to build the soil back up as a sponge, to add life to the soil, to help prevent water from running off. That's the problem with California. We never have enough water until it rains, and then we have too much water, and it all runs out to the ocean. We're not capturing it. We're not creating that filtration. We're not building the subsoil. And so the erosion controls fat, you know, just works great, and then they spray indigenous or native wildflowers on it, and boom, they... They grab the ground immediately, and it, it, it takes the place of a lot of these other things. But you'll see it on construction sites, anywhere where there's runoff, creeks, streams, berms, embankments. Your backyard might have a steep slope coming from a neighbor. Um, and the compost socks are similar to those socks that you see the straw waddles in. But think about almost sort of a fabric pot material and a large sock and the fill the entire thing with compost and you lay it down and now it acts like a biofiltration. So as the water from the erosion is running down the hill, it's having to pass through this compost berm 
And that compost is pulling out a lot of the heavy metals and a lot of the pollutants and a lot of the harmful excess nutrients that are running into the creeks and creating these algal blooms and everything else. And it's capturing that in the compost. And it's also flushed to the ground, much different than those concrete K-rails that you see, that yeah. it looks like all the silt just goes right around. Um, you can use compost berms in conjunction with specific types of plants for bioremediation, which you see them using in sites where uh, petroleum-based runoff or other harmful things uh, that you'll see, which cause you know just severe uh, degradation. And this is something that should be looked at even more in areas of heavy, intense conventional farming. And if you look what's happening to the Gulf of Mexico and everything else that's going downstream from that, you know, I went to register our product in Michigan and the biggest there issue there is phosphates. Um, and na now people have been ignoring it and you've had farmers for years that have been calculating how much fertilizer to add to their land based on how much nitrogen they need to grow per acre of corn. But they're only looking at the nitrogen. They're not looking at the P or the K or the excess load. And I, I don't even know what the, the statistics would be for a state or for this country or for the world. But when you look at like just the fact that we're in a shortage of nutrients, how many excess nutrients just get flushed into our river and waterways and just are choking our aquatic life, which we depend on, which once again, you know, contributes to global warming, you know, if there is such a thing. <laughs> well, this actually b bleeds perfectly into the last question I had for you. Um, so like, you know, we've got, we've got, a, you know, with the last three or four minutes, I heard your presentation last weekend and enjoyed it on, uh, on the organic revolution. And, and, you know, you in your role at Malibu Compost, um, I see you both as, as a, a researcher and product developer. You're trying to figure out these, these techniques for creating this most biodynamic, um, compost that you can. But then also, you're also an evangelist, right? Because you're one part salesperson, you know, encouraging vineyards and cannabis people to use your compost. Um, but also you're doing things like, like right here on my show just pretty much talking about compost for the people and for nature anyway so regardless of your own brand you know just use compost people make it buy it whatever you got to do use it and so you have got a unique seat for this um this this revival of probiotic growing kind of post synthetic inputs and so my question to you is is what are you seeing you know are you are are you seeing that people are are hearing the message and are making the transition or are you seeing that it's falling on deaf ears i am seeing just an absolute i'm seeing a world in flux and i'm seeing problems become greater and greater and more dire and human beings having less and less compassion and communication and on the same side i'm seeing community come back together that we haven't seen in years and the regenerative agriculture movement is so exciting and inspiring because a lot of people just want a better way there must be a better way just please show me and what's happening in this movement, and thank you for what you do, because you're help spreading the word of saying, these are tangible steps that you can take, and they work. There's a better way. And sometimes it might even seem a little more expensive up front, but you have to just look at where it is six months down the road, one year down the road, two years down the road. You know, I've talked to people who've bought truckloads of my compost and put it in their pots, and they haven't bought any the next year because they've talked about the residual impacts on their soil of what's happened after one application of really boosting that soil and creating, you know, if they're growing in ground or in trenches of what they see happen the secondary year and developing a system so they don't have to use as much. Um, and everywhere you look, more and more research is coming out that's showing people a better way to do it. We're realizing, and it's one of those things, you know, the difference between organic and biodynamic versus conventional and a lot of things like this it's not – the differences aren't as, you know, hyper-defined until things have problems. And then it becomes more and more and more clear. I, You know, if I want to do a side-by-side -side trial on a lawn with and without compost, I'm going to find a really crappy lawn. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended to put my compost on because, the you know, it's just going to be that much more dramatic. But we live in dramatic times, you know. 
we live in dramatic times where people have more and more cancers and more and more mental illnesses. And Rudolf Steiner talked about this back in 1924. He said, if people continue to eat food that's devoid of life in the soil, the greatest problems plaguing mankind are going to be cancers and mental illnesses because you have to think about our body and our brain as a highly developed digestive tract and we're a reflection of the nutrition that we receive you know no matter what form it comes to us and so people are coming into this with challenges people are getting into growing cannabis because somebody got cancer you know people are getting into this for all sorts of different reasons but they're coming together and realizing this and With these new platforms of communication, whether it's your podcast, whether it's Instagram, people doing things in the right way, in the ethical way around the world are now sharing information and saying, look at what I've done. Look at what I've done. Look what I did taking what this person has done and built off of it and creating this synergy of knowledge and of information and of tangible practices that we can do in our own gardens, in our own communities, you know, and in our own countries is having a massive residual effect. And people that are doing it are seeing the results. They're healing their cancers. They're healing their diabetes. They're, you know, they're, they're living, you know, they're told they got six months to live and 12 years later they're giving classes on nutrition and soil health. You know, this is the world that we live in. So the inspiration's all around us. You know, again, thank you for what you do because the the knowledge is there and it is a battle. It's a battle. A lot of this work has just been snuffed out by the power of these big chemical companies, by the power of these big agricultural universities, land grant universities, because anytime there's something for someone to gain, somebody else has something to lose. And when you follow the money and you see what other people have to lose and you say, oh, that doesn't sound possible. Well, it's not possible because somebody spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to convince farmers you're right. It isn't possible because they stand to lose everything they have. Absolutely. Well, hot damn, Colm. Like that was that. That's fantastic. I feel uh, very enthusiastic and uh, and actually really really pleased with how this show turned out. Uh, this information is, came together in a really nice package, and and most importantly to me, um, not only does it give the compost basics but we we really went deep into it into like third and fourth levels of analysis so thank you so much for for not only sharing your time because i know your time is very valuable but thank you for sharing your experience both with the compost but with your ability to explain it in a way that we can all grok it without science degrees so thank you so much brother Oh, absolutely. Such a pleasure to talk with you. And thank you again for, you know, spreading the word on so many important topics to so many people. Awesome, man. Thank you. If you'd like to be in contact with Colm Riley, you can reach him through Malibu Malibu Compost at MalibuCompost.com. You can also follow his uh, Instagram, which is a lot of fun, at Colm Riley. And that's um, uh, C-O-L-U-M. R I L E Y uh, on Instagram. And then also be sure to check out his great presentation at Indo Expo in San Francisco in his entirety for free on our YouTube channel at YouTube forward slash Shango Los. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I'll be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los.